for the next three talks, we just wanted to give you a bit of a flavour of some of the research that's going on in, in NUI Minute. We have several different research groups um, that will take master's students and PhD students that will work under the supervision of a member of staff. We obviously couldn't get someone from all the groups here. And um, Peter's here. Peter's, uh, you probably met Peter this morning. Uh, he runs a group at Cluster Physics. Michael Coley has a group at Fluid Dynamics. Um, if anyone has got a particular interest in looking around the department, you can always arrange to go as our lecture students come in and have a look around. So today we just picked two to give you a bit of a flavour of what's going on. We have a sort of a terahertz and submillimeter wave astronomy uh, group, and Neil will talk about that. I'll also give a talk on another aspect. And Frank Mulligan has a group on atmospheric physics. So they're the two that we're going to talk about, um, but we have several other groups um, in the college. So Neil will talk first. Don't Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody and welcome to Minute. Um, I'm just going to very quickly go through um, one of the European Space Agency projects that the Experiment Physics Department here are involved in. And it's the Herschel Space Observatory that was actually launched in May 2009 and is currently producing data. And I'll talk to you about what the instrument is proposed to do, what our involvement in Minute was in the project, and also just give you a very brief um, look at a few of the different scientific results that have been um, published and are now um, showing the use and the value of these two instruments. Gray is also going to talk in a few minutes about the other European Space Agency uh, mission that was launched on, this, on, on the same rocket actually called PANC. That's looking at the relic of the Big Bang. But I'm going to talk about the Herschel Space Observatory, named after William Herschel. But um, this is a, what I'm going to refer to as a long wavelength or a submillimeter or a far infrared observatory. It's looking at the very cold universe, effectively, and um, the interstellar medium, the dust and gas that, um, from which stars form and has, has a very important role to play in star formation and um, in the nature of the universe. So this is the instrument that I'm going to talk about, and then Craig will talk about Planck um, next. So just very quickly to talk about um, the electromagnetic spectrum and actually the part of the spectrum that this instrument actually targets. And it's somewhere around here. We often refer to it as terahertz radiation, and that just refers to the frequency, um, uh, 10 to the 12 hertz. It's somewhere between infrared and microwave um, wavelengths or frequencies, and it's the last part of the electromagnetic spectrum to be truly utilized routinely. And that's because it's quite difficult to produce cheap sources or cheap detec detectors to actually um, produce or detect this radiation, because um, the technologies that radio astronomers use um, doesn't span to this part, or the techniques that optical astronomers use doesn't span very well either. So the technology is a little bit of a mix of both technologies, and it's still really in development, and um, it's not routinely or widely known, and it's probably the last part of the electromagnetic spectrum really to be utilised. If you're trying to do astronomy at this wavelength regime, it's diff very difficult because of those technological reasons, but also because of the Earth's atmosphere. This is just a graph again showing we're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum going from high frequency to low frequency here. So this is the optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum and re um, you know, light propagates through the atmosphere no problem apart from the turbulence but you can, do, you can do all your optical observations at this wavelength. And radio astronomy have, has no difficulty either at long wavelengths the radio waves propagate through the atmosphere. But this is the part of the spectrum that we're interested in. And you can see that the radiation itself gets attenuated before it actually reaches the Earth. So you're in trouble. There's two methods you can get around that. First of all, you could launch satellites like the European Space Agency has done, put the instrument into space so there's no atmosphere. Or also, you can just about observe from very high um, altitudes and also very dry regions because it's effectively the water vapor in the atmosphere that attenuates the signal. So dry high sites are, are, can be used on Earth. Good examples are Chile, Mauna Kea in Hawaii and also Antarctica is a very good site because it's extremely dry down there as well. You may have heard a few, well you may or may not heard but there's lots of terrestrial applications associated with this terahertz technology. Very briefly, there's lots of medical applications. This is um, a cross-section of a, a cancerous tumour where the, 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 the region shows up when illuminated with terahertz radiation. This is a cross-section of a human tooth, and again, you can see the internal um, cavity. 
Um, from a security point of view, it's quite an interesting <coughs> regime to observe as well, because lots of materials are transparent, like clothes and cloth and paper, etc. So that, you know, there's, there's, there, people are playing around with the idea of putting terahertz scanners in the airport to um, scan for concealed weaponry and stuff like that. But I'm really going to talk about the astronomy um, application of that today. The European Space Agency, Ireland is part of the European Space Agency, one of the original members to join, and um, was formed in 1975. There are 18 members. Ireland spends roughly about six million per, per annum um, contributing um, money to the European Space Agency. And scientists and engineers and space scientists can get that money back then through development of technology, development of um, industry in Ireland um, associated with the space industry. And that's how, how, how our um, collaboration with the European Space Agency works. They're probably most famous for their Ariane 5 rocket, which launches lots of commercial satellites as well as the scientific instruments that we're talking about. They have a whole range of um, scientific instrumentation looking at all different parts of the universe, and um, we won't go, have time to go into all of them, but um, we'll talk about these two here today. So Herschel is the one I'm talking about, and we're targeting this part of the electromagnetic spectrum that is... Um, effectively between infrared and microwave. It's fire infrared, so we're looking at really very low levels of heat energy coming from very cold objects in the universe, not very bright objects at all. It was launched in May 2009 simultaneously with the Planck um, satellite as well, and it's launched to a very exotic orbit as well. It's launched to what we call L2, which is a Lagrangian point or a stable point in the, in the solar system, where, uh, well, <coughs> a neutral gravitational point, but it's actually four times the distance um, to the moon away from the Earth in its current observing site, quite close to the other instrument plan. So at this point here, at all its points away from the Earth and all its points away from the sun, because they're very hot sources, and um, <coughs> with the, the various instrument, sensitive instrumentation, you always want to be looking away from very hot sources. So it can constantly scan the sky and measure um, radiation coming from very cold objects in the universe. Now... The, the most important cold objects that it looks at is the interstellar medium, and that's the dust and gas from which stars form and which um, isn't bound up in, in the stellar bodies. The uh, observatory itself is, is just named after William Herschel, who's attributed with detecting um, the first infrared radiation or, or the first heat um, from light. He also um, discovered the planet Uranus as well, and just I think the portrait of him there shows his telescope where he discovered that planet as well. Um, the reason astronomers do this kind of work, of course, because, you know, you say optical astronomy is very well um, established as a science. But when you observe at different wavelengths, you learn different things about the universe. And all phenomena in the universe can't be observed just looking with normal light. So here's just a picture um, of an optical photograph of the sky showing the constellation Orion. And again, this is an infrared image, um, similar to what, I, uh, what Herschel will observe. And you can see that the dust and gas that surrounds the, the stellar regions shows up much more brightly here. It's not visible at all in the optical. So very often, um, it's not just good enough to observe in the optical. You need the different techniques, looking at different wavelengths, to see the different physical conditions that are out there in the universe. Just to talk about the instrument itself, it was a really a cutting-edge instrument on, on all levels, and Minute well, effectively was involved in one instrument on it and involved in the optics of it. But of course, it was, there's, it, it, it's really cutting-edge engineering from a lots of point of view. It's the biggest mirror ever to be launched into space, a 3.5-metre mirror made of silicon carbide. It's looking at a completely new window that was never observed before, this infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's using three different instruments on board to actually do it, um, they all have different targets, different capabilities that allow it to combine images together to get an overall good um, window on this new part of the spectrum that we haven't really looked at before. It's limited to about three years of operation because, we're, as I said, we're looking at very cold objects, so the telescope itself has to be colder than what you're looking at. So it's cooled with liquid helium, and of course when the liquid helium runs out in your prior state of your fridge, your mission will be... Um, degraded because your telescope warms up, you're not able to look at very cold objects anymore. Minute has been involved in one of these instruments, which is HiFi, which is a high-resolution spectrometer. So it's not a photo, photographic device, it's not taking um, infrared photographs, it's an actually analysing the light through its spectrum. You're looking at absorption lines, emission lines, and using those lines to understand the physics of where, how those lines are produced. And it tells you an awful lot about the environment, probably a lot more than actually just taking images. 
Um, this is just a quick breakdown of the instrument. Again, the, the main component is this cryostatter, the fridge where your, your scientific instrumentation is housed. You've got the telescope, you've got sun shields, and you've got the kind of service module to deal with data transfer and all the processes associated with it. So Minuta is involved effectively in the optical design and uh, testing and analysis of the Hi-Fi instrument, one of the three instruments on board the satellite. We've been involved since 1999 through all the phases of development of the project. It takes many, many years for the, uh, the, the project to be planned, envisaged, tested, calibrated, and finally launched. So even though, of course, we've been involved in the design and analysis of some of the optics and just, just, just some of of the optics shown here, um, we still have a student working on the data calibration and analysis and subtracting systematic effects from the data that the instrument is currently producing from space. So Minute has been involved in a long time in this project. And our main area of work, um, we don't get into too, many, too much detail, is the optical analysis. So this is one of our simulations and, and layout of how we would simulate the optical design of this instrument. So you can't use the normal ray tracing that you could apply to normal short, short wavelength optical systems because the fraction dominates the radiation as it propagates through the optics. So we have to use specialized techniques, electromagnetics effectively, um, to model the, ray pro the, the, the radiation propagating through the optics. And because the signals are so weak, you want to couple as much of that power to your detectors as efficiently as possible, and that's why the optical design of such an instrument is very, very important, because you're looking at extremely weak signals, so the more signal you can detect, the better science you can do. This is um, a picture of just some of the, this is actually a, a picture of the Hi-Fi instrument itself. It's about the size of a large rucksack. It's not very big at all, and uh, all the optics are housed in here. That's a picture way back on the day of doing some optical testing in Esron, or the Space Research Organization of the Netherlands, who were um, commissioning the instrument, and we were working closely with. Um, just to finish up, I'm just going to talk, show you a few pictures of some of the data that's been relayed back um, to Earth from the instrument and just showing some of the quality that it's actually produced. This is um, a spiral galaxy, M74, Mercier 74, um, I think it's in Pisces constellation. And this is a picture from the NASA Spitzer instrument, which was um, a predecessor of the Herschel Space Observatory. And you can see the Herschel um, image compared to the old Spitzer NASA image, and you can see really enhanced resolution a lot more spiral structure being um, shown in the, in the Herschel image. So it, 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 it shows the quality of the optics to get to the spatial resolution, and also the level of sensitivity, that the detectors are becoming more sensitive, and you can get um, better sensitivity with the new instrument as well. Um, again, these are just uh, a few more uh, images of a spiral galaxy, or the Whirlpool galaxy, that uh, Lord Ross, actually, from Borough, who was mentioned earlier on, was one of the first to observe and note the spiral nature of this object. And again, we're looking here, just again to talk very briefly, three different wavelengths, as 160 micron, 100 micron, and 70 micron. That refers to the wavelength at which the image is actually taken. And again, you can see that there's slightly different structures showing up in the different wavelengths, showing the importance of actually a bandwidth or, or observing at a number of wavelengths or frequencies. This is a lovely um, image of the Rosette molecular cloud. This is a region where a star formation actually occurs, that the dust and gas will collapse to form uh, uh, nuclear, uh, or will collapse before nuclear fusion will start. So again, you can see really good spatial <coughs> resolution, really good detail, really high quality images returned from this instrument. This is the first nature paper produced from the instrument um, explaining how water can be observed um, through one of these exotic um, asymptotic giant stars, a very exotic type of star, but um, again just showing the, the chemistry and physics associated with stellar science that previously wasn't really um, observable with other wavelength regimes. And finally, I'll just finish up with this, which is... Um, for us, is a, is a really spectacular image showing a spectral line at, um, produced by the high fire instrument that we've been working at at Minute. So you, look, you observe a star forming region and you analyze the spectral lines associated with the dust and gas, well, primarily um, uh, uh, gas present in here. And you can see all kinds of exotic um, molecules, um, uh, organic molecules, water, which could never be observed because of the Earth's atmosphere before. So this is really unprecedented science that was never seen before and is very, um, very novel and very useful for scientists to learn all about star forming regions and effectively the cold universe that we couldn't really observe very efficiently before. 
So I know everyone's conscious of time, so I think I'll leave it there. Neil, I thank you very much for your